So I'm going to take this uh, vector v, which is just a vector 1, a inverse, uh, a to the minus k, and then zeros. Okay, so some fixed k. So you can see where it comes from, right? It comes from this picture here. That's going to be roughly what the, what the eigenvector of this uh, operator should be that corresponds to the, to the top um, eigenvalue. So we check. You can check. It's, uh, is it an eigenvector? It's not quite an eigenvector, but it can be almost an eigenvector. Right? So we look at JV. Well, let's say so J over root n. So, so we, we normalized. So remember this J over root n on the top corner, it almost looks like the the matrix which has just has ones on the off diagonal and zeros on the on diagonal. We have seen that last time. So j over root 10, the top corner of that, just very close to that, that matrix, which has zeros here and it's on the off diagonal, uh, except for this a, of course, which you see. <coughs> Let me call it g a, g so, g a so that you can distinguish from the unperturbed j. It's too small, right? So g a over root n. And let's plug in this vector v. OK? So again, g a over root n is very close to this particular operator. Right? It, it, it has these ones on the off diagonal, and it has this a loop. Um, so, so v is almost an eigenvector, and we can roughly say what is the error. So if I subtract from this v times a plus 1 over a, can look at the norm of that. Well, there is some error coming from the noise in the chi's, but that's small. That's like going to zero. That's clear. And then, because these chi's are very close to to 1 when you divide them by square root of n. And there's, some, there's some error coming from these normals, but that's, again, that's going to 0. Remember, k is fixed. We're just looking up to a finite depth. Um, so that's fine. But there is an error coming from the end, which is that we stopped playing around with this at this point. Just, there's just zeros afterwards. So there, the, there is the eigenvalue equation doesn't quite satisfy. So there is an error, but you can tell you how much it is. It's roughly like a to the minus k times some constant. Because that's how much the entries of this vector are there. Is this OK? So when you, when you look at, compare the, the, the vector times uh, the, the vector plugged into the matrix times a vector times its eigenvalue, then you get an error of this, uh, error of this size. OK? So now this v, um, OK, so, so if you have an equation like this with a v which has a norm 1, OK, then it, tell, it tells you that this matrix has to have an eigenvalue close to this number, uh, and the distance is as most this. Okay. You have seen this kind of approximate eigenvalue equations. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna prove it. That prove that. If you want, you can do it as an exercise. But but the, but the conclusion. I just write it down. So J over root n um, has an eigenvalue. Um, uh, well, I leave here some dot, 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 close to a plus 1 over a. Okay. If, you, if you satisfy the approximate eigenvalue equation, then there is an, there is an eigenvalue nearby. <coughs> uh, how close is it? Well, you know, it, it's, uh, because this v is not of length 1, we have to normalize it so that, so that what, what would happen if we plugged in something uh, that depends on v? But, but the, you know, the, 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 the normal, uh, normalization is the length of v, and v is never sh too short. So, so, so we are fine. Actually, we can just keep this, because v is always of length 1, so we can just keep this uh, bound. 
Okay. So, so now, now we have shown, okay, we were pretty good. We have shown that there is some eigenvalue. We, right, by setting k to be large, well, sufficiently large, we can show that there is some eigenvalue uh, that will converge to this number. This, this so far we have proved. We just have to make sure that this is the top eigenvalue. Okay? And there are, there, are, there are no other eigenvalues above uh, this, this one. Um, so maybe I should say GA, GA. But this actually follows from interlacing. Because you remember, so here are the eigenvalues of GA. Let's say. And you do, when you do a positive perturbation of rank one, this is a standard fact that you probably know or heard, uh, then the eigenvalues of the new matrix will interlace with this one. And, and all of them move up some, somewhat, but they never overtake the next one. Okay, so this, this is where the new eigenvalues could be. Okay. So, so I've identified, so this is GA and this is J. So I, I identified that JA has an eigenvalue here, near higher than the top of the eigen, top eigenvalue of J, but because it's higher, it has to be the top one. Okay, all the others are less than or equal to, uh, to, to the eigenvalues of J. So since lambda 2 of GA, so the second largest eigenvalue of GA, is less than or equal to lambda 1 of J, okay, and which, is, which we know is, uh, um, let's write it like that, square root of n, 2 square root of n, square root of n times 2 plus little o 1, right? We have seen that from convolution theory. Uh, this eigenvalue has to be lambda 1. OK? So that's the, that's the, that's the end of the proof. Um, any questions? Yes? When we used the, the first lemma clutch theorem to code this, we actually only ever really used the upper bounds. We never actually showed um, So I, I, I gave a, an oral argument <laughs> of why it should be at least two. And what I claim is that it's just follows from the Wigner semicircle law, right? Because if the empirical eigenvalue distribution converges to the Wigner semicircle law, then there has to be at least one eigenvalue near the top of the Wigner semicircle law. So it has to be at least two. It, it doesn't give you anything above. It could be anywhere above, and in many cases there are. For example, if you take for any A, uh, these J's will still satisfy the Wigner semicircle law. This actually follows from interlacing. Right, because uh, the, all the, the other eigenvalues will be interlaced with the previous ones. So, and this will not contribute, because it just has a weight 1 over n. So, so the Wigner semicircle law is still OK for this GA. Excuse me? Um, well, I think the issue is, how do you tell that this is not a third eigenvalue? Well, it doesn't really matter because you know that it's at least that much. You know it's, it's that much. There could be one which is, which is twice as large. All right. How do you rule that out? How do, how do I rule? I don't have an upper bound. That's the problem. Okay. So, so I, I, don't have an, I don't have a direct upper bound on the, on this, on the top eigenvalue anywhere else except from here, except from this argument. That was the point. 
Uh, which theorem? No, it doesn't give you a good enough upper bound. Yeah, that's the problem. So it, 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 you see what it gives you, that's a good question. So what it gives you is, uh, what is it? It's one plus A, right, I think. Yeah, it gives you one plus A as an upper bound. And in fact, the true upper bound is, is uh, the, the true thing is uh, one over A plus A. This is the truth, and this is the bound. Okay? So it's clearly, it's, it's not good enough. Yeah, good question. Thanks. So I wonder where the randomness went away, because the process seems to go. Um, so so that's, a, that's a great question. And the answer to that is, is this is exactly what uh, these kind of models are good for, which is you're able to separate what, 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 is, what, what comes from randomness and what comes from, you know, essentially looking like a, looking like a semicircle distribution. So, so for example, in this case, uh, this is, has very little to do with randomness, right? We, uh, we didn't really use, the only thing we used uh, the way we use randomness is just use that these normals are small, they're of order one. That's all, we, that's all we said. And the chi's are also some deterministic things with something of order one. Uh, but that's not crucial. So, so the beta ensembles, you remember, they, they did, did look like GUEs, GOE or GUE, except the repulsion was stronger. So. When uh, you set beta, send beta to infinity, right, that then the repulsion gets stronger and stronger, and the eigenvalues become rigid. Okay. In fact, uh, in the limit, the eigenvalues will. There is a limiting eigenvalue distribution for finite n, and there is no randomness in it. For finite n, when you take this kind of beta go to infinity limit, you you get the Hermite polynomial zeros as eigenvalues. Um, and this Jacobi matrix uh, becomes just the recursion matrix for the Hermite polynomials. Uh, and even in that case, this kind of argument works. This argument is unchanged. So. OK. <clears throat> Um, so let me, this was Bike Ben Ruth Lache, and uh, I wanted to tell you about beta ensembles. Mm. So that requires, I'll be able to start this today, but maybe not finish. Okay, and and we're going to show what we're going to prove is the Edelman, uh, Dimitri Edelman theorem. Okay, so you, let's let's go back. You remember we had this uh, kind of a general uh, abstract argument for Jacobi matrices. So we said two matrices are equivalent if their spectral measure is the same. Uh, we said well. This is equivalent to saying they're conjugate to each other. As long as you're talking about uh, this um, cyclic vector case, uh, it's equivalent to saying that they're conjugate to each other by some orthogonal matrix, which is uh, one on the top corner. Uh, and it's also, there is also a unique representative for all these matrices uh, for, for an equivalence class, which is a Jacobi matrix. You have proved in your problem session this uniqueness. Uh, so, so as you see, there is um, 
there is some kind of correspondence between spectral measures Okay, so, so, so the data that describe the spectral measure is, 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 the, is lambda 1, lambda n, so n, n points, and then some spectral weights, which we call q1, qn. So, and their sum is 1, because it's a probability measure. And, and sigma is just sum of delta lambda i times qi. Right? This is a spectral measure. And as you see, these are described by 2n minus 1 pieces of data. And then there are also the uh, matrix entries. Which is a1, an, b1, bn minus 1. Um, so, so what did we, how did we uh, go about this? So we ha if we had a matrix with a specific spe spectral measure, then for that there existed a Jacobi matrix, a unique one. Okay. And of course if you have a Jacobi matrix, there is a spectral measure for that. Um, now, this sort of almost gives you a one-to-one -one correspondence. There is actually one thing that's missing. <laughs> what's missing? Um, what's missing is that you don't necessarily know that for a given matrix, given, spe given spectral measure, there is a matrix with the spectral measure. Okay, well, certainly there is a matrix with those eigenvalues, but can you set the spectral measure to be this? Well, the answer is yes, so I, I leave it as an exercise. Okay. You just have to find a general symmetric matrix with the spectral measure, because then we know that there is also a Jacobi matrix like that. So for every measure which is supported on n distinct points, there exists uh, a matrix. Uh, I'm just going to write it quickly. So for every, every sigma, there exists a J. That's a nice exercise. Um, and so, and so, this is nice because you know it's it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. We don't exactly know. I mean, uh, how this works, this correspondence. I mean, you can certainly find these. I mean, if you have matrices, you can find those eigenvalues. It's true, you're just solving algebraic equations. Uh, so I guess this correspondence is, is, is algebraic, even. So one way to... to um, but we're probabilists, right? So we want to understand what happens if we pick these to sum a law at random. Then what's going to happen to these things? What is going to be their law? So, as opposed to the case of full random matrices, this is a very simple problem, because it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, so you just have to compute the Jacobian okay. of a transformation. Except you don't know what the transformation is, it's a bit complicated. So, so here is a, how, what you do, there you, you use a trick, and this is the trick that, you know, you always use a random matrix theory. You, you know the matrix, and you, know, you want to know th something about the eigenvalues. So more often than not, what you do is, well, go to the moments, because those are connected to both easily, in a simple way. Right? So, so if you can write mi to be, or mk, to be the integral of x to the k, d sigma, right? So this is the, which is sum of lambda i to the k. Qi, the kth moment, um, then certainly you can write here m1 and mk, 
M2K minus 1. It's a good idea to go up to 2K minus 1 because you'd like to have here 2K minus 1 data points. And you see that both of these things are very, are very easily connected to here. Right? So certainly, if you have the measure, it's very easy to compute the moments. OK, that's easy. And if you have the moments, or no, if you have the matrix, it's again very easy to compute the moments. You just do this path counting. Right? So it's a sum over returning path of the product of the weights over the path. It so, so this is also easy. Another nice exercise is to show that these moments, they actually determine the, the, the Jacobi matrix. In fact, we'll see it in a second. That's, that's very simple. So, so the moments determine the matrix, the matrix determines the measure, the moments determine the measure. We, are, we, have, we got this again. It's simple in this case. <clears throat> so so uh, the way to understand probabilistically what happens is very simple. I, there's a transformation goes in, going from here to here, which is simple. Right? It's just a polynomial. Mk is a polynomial in these guys. It's also a polynomial in these guys. So we just write down the Jacobi matrices and hope we can find their determinants. Okay, that's, that's it. So, um, let me, let me give you a, let me give you a conclusion. Two more minutes, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I'll give you the conclusion. <laughs> hmm. OK, so here is a theorem, which is partly the Dimitri Edelman theorem, but it's a slight generalization that we, we gave uh, with uh, Krishnapur, Ryder, and myself, uh, which is that, which is the following. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a way to, OK. So let's say that you look at the matrix if A and B are chosen from the following distribution, okay? so this is what the distribution looks like. You look, it's exponential of minus trace uh, V of T, V of J. Okay? So what is it? V is some polynomial, a potential actually. But in the simplest case, it's just a p p polynomial. So you take, the tra take, the, take this polynomial of your matrix, take the trace of that, exponentiate. And then there is an extra term which has the b's in them. So it's n minus k times beta. Let me write it like that. Uh, k times beta. Uh, minus 1 and log b n minus k. OK, so this is a density that you put on the a's and b's. Uh, it's, you know, this is just some polynomial here of, of the a's and b's. And this is just a logarithmic term. So it just will come out and multiply the b's. Um, then, uh, then the eigenvalues have distribution. Uh, again, it's exponential of minus sum of v of lambda i. Okay, so this polynomial of the lambda i's. And then it's multiplied by a Vendermann. OK. Uh, and finally, um, let me write, and the Q are independent 
of the lambda. Okay, so the spectral weights are independent of the lambda and have Dirichlet beta over two, beta over two distribution. Okay, so right, my time is out, so let me just say what this means. So when you plug V equals X squared, okay, then these entries will be independent because trace of V squared will just have some of the squares of the entries. Okay. The A's will be Gaussian because you just have A squared here in the density or exponential of A squared here in this density. The B's are going to be going to have some density which is exponential in A squared and B squared and in this logarithmic term. So the B's are actually going to be chi's. Okay, so. Um, and so one of the corollaries is that the base ensemble can be, when V is uh, just X squared, then this, this Gaussian beta ensemble, what it's called, has a representation as a tridiagonal matrix with independent entries. Yeah, and that's, that theorem is due to Dumitri and Edelman. When V is more complicated, then the entries are not independent, but the dependence is not very strong. So there's still, there's still things you can do. Um, so uh, maybe I'll stop now and we'll continue tomorrow. <laughs>